At least four attempts were made to assassinate Italian dictator Benito Mussolini before he finally got his comeuppance as he was trying to flee the country in 1945. One of them almost succeeded. Violet Gibson, a bedraggled 50-year-old Irishwoman, came so close that she grazed Il Duce's nose with her first bullet. She has been hailed as an anti-fascist freedom fighter and commemorated with a plaque in her native Dublin. But what really drove her to try and take out Mussolini? I'm Professor Graham Yorston, neuropsychiatrist, and today I'm at the grave of Violet Gibson, exploring the incredible story of the woman who shot Mussolini and almost changed history. The Honourable Violet Albina Gibson was born in Dublin in 1876. Her father was lawyer and politician Baron Ashbourne, who served as Lord High Chancellor of Ireland for 20 years. Her early life was one of wealth and privilege. She was presented as a debutante to Queen Victoria at 18, and thereafter was expected to attend the circuit of society events until she found a husband. She dutifully complied and attended balls and soirees in London and Dublin. But she was a little different to her siblings. Her sister described her as hysterical and impatient of restraint, who would fly off into the most powerful tempers for the least trifle and often lost control of herself. Her mother was a devotee of the new American religion that had just arrived in the UK, Christian Science and Violet dabbled with this before moving on to Theosophy, a strange fusion of Eastern religion, occultism and philosophy invented by Ukrainian mystic Madame Blavatsky. In her early 20s, she traveled around Europe to attend Theosophy lodges, but in 1902, at the age of 26, she suddenly converted to Catholicism, much to her father's displeasure. At first, her parents tried to continue her involvement in society events, hoping she would come to her senses, but she gradually began to distance herself from her family. In 1905, one of her brothers died of tuberculosis, and she drifted further away from the world she increasingly despised and into London's bohemian artistic world. She found love, briefly, and was engaged to an artist, but when he died suddenly in 1909, she travelled to Rome to find solace in the art and spirituality of the Eternal City. It all proved a little too much for her, and she came down with a mystery fever, and her sister had to come out to Italy for several months to look after her until she was well enough to return. Back in England, she moved to Buckfastley, a small town next to the famous abbey on the edge of Dartmoor, where she lived an austere life, supported by an allowance from her father and a bequest from an aunt who died falling off a horse in British India. Although now a committed Catholic, she was still interested in other religions and attended a Theosophy conference in Berlin in 1912. The following year, her father died, and although she attended his funeral in Dublin, she travelled separately from the rest of her family. In 1914, she developed Paget's disease of the nipple. As this is usually associated with an underlying cancer, she had a mastectomy, which left her with a nine-inch scar. During the First World War, she spent some time in Paris, where she is said to have worked as a peace activist, although it's not clear what she actually did, and there is no evidence she ever worked in the conventional sense anywhere. She returned to England in 1915 and was plagued by ill health. And the following year, she had a burst appendix and peritonitis, a medical emergency that only around 10% of people survived at that time. She recovered, but was left with lifelong abdominal pain from adhesions. Now in her 40s, Violet lived modestly in Kensington, becoming increasingly obsessed with religion. She spent her time at prayer and reading the lives of the saints and martyrs over and over again. She went on retreats run by an American Jesuit, John O'Fallon Pope, who preached that the degree of a person's holiness depended on the degree of their mortification, and that true believers were obliged to intervene in God's name in human affairs. Dangerous messages for someone in a fragile mental state. She became fixated on the ideas of martyrdom and mortification. This usually means fasting, wearing hair shirts or self-flagellation. But in Violet's own notebook, she wrote that mortification meant putting to death. In 1922, another of her brothers died in mysterious circumstances, found dead in the armchair of an inn. Violet was deeply affected and a month later she began acting strangely going to the Priory of the Carmelite Friars in Kensington, grabbing hold of one of the brothers and trying to force her way into the monastic enclosure. A doctor was summoned and she was advised to go to a nearby nursing home for a week. In her letters, she dismissed the episode, saying it was nothing of importance and that for seven hours I was possessed by a good spirit and for five hours 
by a bad one. She then travelled to Compiègne in France to stay with her brother, who on the death of his father in 1913 had become second Baron Ashbourne. Described as a half-hatched philosopher, he had Irish nationalist sympathies, and on taking up his place in the House of Lords to join a debate on Ireland, he began speaking in Gaelic. He also had radical ideas for modernising the Catholic Church, which he discussed at length with Violet, and before she left, she announced that the Pope had betrayed the Church and should be eliminated. Back in London, her mind kept churning over the moral issue of whether a pious Catholic could ever consider it right to kill. In October 1923, Violet left the house in the small hours in her nightclothes and had to be brought back by two policemen. The next day, she slipped out again and the housekeeper's daughter was sent to follow her to make sure she was safe. She was behaving very strangely. After walking between vehicles in the middle of the road for a while, she went down to the cellar area of her house. When the girl tried to see what she was doing, she pulled a knife out of her bag and launched at her, cutting her face and hands so that she needed four stitches. When she was found, she had her Bible open at the story of Abraham and the almost sacrifice of his son Isaac. She was taken to St Mary Abbott's Hospital, where she was examined by two doctors and certified as insane. Sitting on the floor of a padded room, she called out for more people to kill, saying she'd already nearly killed one and must have some more. She assaulted another patient and had to be restrained. After a few days, she was transferred to the more salubrious environs of Holloway Sanatorium, 20 miles from London in Leafy, Surrey. This was a hospital founded specifically for the temporarily insane of the middle classes by Thomas Holloway, a wealthy businessman and philanthropist, and no expense was spared in creating architecturally pleasing buildings and pleasant grounds. It was known for its innovative therapies, such as massage and gym exercise, but other, less progressive methods were also used, including the dry pack, being tightly wrapped in blankets, which led to the death of a patient in 1896 and questions in Parliament about how the management of the sanatorium could be put onto a more satisfactory footing. In hospital, she was confused in her thoughts and talking about how she had tried to persuade a dentist to take out all of her front teeth so that she wouldn't get toothache if she became a nun. She was described as wet and dirty meaning that she was wetting and soiling herself, an indication of just how well she was. Ominously, she also admitted that she still might want to try and kill someone. When a friend visited her, Violet said that she was convinced she was doing something great for God, but she was not going to tell the doctors about this. Slowly, she improved and became clearer of mind, talking more and going out for walks in the airing courts. After three months, she was cheerful and friendly and was allowed to go on leave to live with her mother, the Dowager Lady Ashbourne in Belgravia, a very upmarket part of London. It's a common misconception to think that mental hospitals a century ago were evil institutions organised by an oppressive state solely to lock away socially inconvenient people who'd done nothing more than have a baby out of wedlock or spoken out of turn. This is simply not true. There were, of course, scandals about deaths and mistreatment, and I am not for a moment suggesting that they were without problems. Have a look at my video on Dr Henry Cotton in New Jersey if you want to see the darker side of asylum care. But what comes across most from research involving the actual clinical records of these hospitals is that the overwhelming majority of patients had serious mental illnesses. The other commonly believed myth is that admission to one of these hospitals was a one-way ticket. In reality, the last thing the administrators wanted was to have a low cure rate. They wanted to demonstrate that their hospitals improved patients, so were very keen for people to be discharged as soon as possible. This can be seen in Violet's case. Less than three months after trying to kill an innocent girl, she was allowed out on leave. I suspect that in similar circumstances nowadays, she would have been in hospital a lot longer. All seemed well for a few months until the general election of October 1924. She had pledged herself to a sacrifice if the Labour government of Ramsay MacDonald was toppled, and after news of the Conservative victory came in, she hurriedly packed and set off for Rome, accompanied by a nurse, stroke companion and a revolver. She stayed at a convent and spent her days praying and in the working class district of Trastevere, giving out small sums of money to the poor. By this stage, she had become convinced that God wanted her to kill someone she just wasn't sure who. Wondering if it might be her, she shot herself in the chest. Miraculously, she survived, but at first refused to see a doctor, declaring that she wanted to die for the glory of God. Eventually, she relented and had surgery to remove the bullet, 
Her brother Willie came to Rome to persuade her to return to England, but she refused, knowing that she would likely be committed if she went back with him. After a lot of persuasion, she agreed to a voluntary admission to hospital, where she remained for two months, contrite and apologetic, and insisting that she had no further thoughts of repeating her actions. She then spent a year in a convent, keeping herself to herself and never discussing politics. In March 1926, her sister telegraphed, saying her mother had had a stroke. Violet packed up and prepared to leave, but then received the news that she had died. Events moved fast after this. She dismissed her nurse, and a woman matching her description was seen acting strangely in crowds watching Mussolini. Her brother came out to Rome, fearing that their mother's death would affect her badly, but he couldn't find her. She had left the convent and was in a hotel. Staff said that she appeared as one who had lost all human sensibility, walking with her body absolutely upright, her eyes staring and her arms dangling at her sides. She neither acknowledged nor replied to greetings. A week passed and on April the 7th, she went to the Piazza del Campidoglio in Rome, where Mussolini was walking among adoring crowds after giving a speech. She was carrying a revolver wrapped in a black veil. Mussolini stopped a few feet away. She lifted the gun, aimed, but just as she pulled the trigger, Mussolini leaned back to acknowledge the crowd and the bullet grazed his nose. Violet tried to fire again, but the gun jammed. Bleeding from his nose, Mussolini remained calm and told people around him not to be afraid. This is a mere trifle, he said. But the crowd turned on her, pushed her to the ground and stamped on her. The police had to fight off the mob to get her away before she was killed. On hearing of Violet's arrest, her family immediately wrote to the Italian government, apologizing for her actions. Her sister wrote that she often gave way to paroxysms of grief and the death of her mother had finally unhinged her mind. When asked why she shot Mussolini, she said it was to glorify God and that she had been sent an angel to steady her aim. When asked about accomplices, she said she had been counseled by the wisest men who had ever lived. And although they were now dead, she had a special ability to communicate with them. She wrote to her friend about what had happened. The people set on me, pulled out my hair and rained blows on me. The bravery of the police saved my life. My clothes were torn to pieces and my holy red medals ripped from me. But inside I was transported to another place that had nothing to do with politics. And without any effort on my part, my heart was filled with sweetness and a great love. At first she was placed in a prison but after she attacked another inmate with a hammer, shouting, it was against the will of God that Mussolini should continue to exist, she was moved to an asylum. After several months, Professor Augusto Gianelli concluded she was a closed character, taciturn, mistrusting, meek but suspicious and jealous of her liberty and independence, intolerant of any control and a lover of isolation. She had a propensity to disregard the counsel of others, including friends, and harboured a persecution complex, consistently blaming her family for being the cause of her illness. She was diagnosed with chronic paranoia and returned to prison, where she continued to cause problems, at one point smashing a chamber pot on a guard's head. Six months later, and while Violet was in prison, 15-year-old Anteo Zamboni made another attempt to shoot Mussolini, who used the attack as a pretext for outlawing all other parties and passing a raft of oppressive legislation. After months of diplomatic efforts, Mussolini agreed for her to be deported back to England and in May 1937, she arrived in London after a long train journey across Europe. After a brief examination by two doctors, a diagnosis of delusional insanity with paranoia was made. After the requisite paperwork was completed, she was put on another train 60 miles north to Northampton, where she spent the rest of her life. She spent 30 years at St Andrew's Hospital. Some accounts describe this as a dark and oppressive place but it is actually one of the most architecturally pleasing hospitals in the country. I know, I worked there for 11 years. This was my office. It was established in 1838 and pioneered the treatment of patients without the use of mechanical restraints. It was regarded as the hospital of choice for royalty and members of the aristocracy. And even in my time, some of the wards had fine antique furniture and an air of gentility. Violet always maintained that there was nothing wrong with her and continually asked to be discharged but from time to time she would become agitated and aggressive, on one occasion attacking staff and other patients with a broom. She would talk of seeing the devil in her room, and in 1930 she collected strips of cloth to make a rope, not to escape, but to make an attempt on her life. There were no effective treatments for psychosis at this time, so her condition remained stable, but did not improve. 
The priority of treatment was keeping her and others safe from her delusionally driven desire to harm. Violet passed away in 1956. Her family requested a quiet funeral with no one in attendance, and she's buried here in Kingsthorpe Cemetery in Northampton. Not far from her compatriot, Lucia, James Joyce's daughter, who also lived out her life at St Andrews. It will probably be clear by now that I don't agree with those who are trying to turn Violet Gibson into some kind of heroic anti-fascist freedom fighter. She was a woman with a severe mental illness who tried to kill a servant girl, attacked patients in hospital, and had ideas about taking out the Pope long before she set her sights on Mussolini. So is it right to put up a plaque to commemorate Violet? I don't think so. I think the plaque is for those who would wish to rewrite history for their own ends. And that is a dangerous thing to do. Before I finish, I must say a big thank you to John Ward in Ottawa for suggesting this topic. And if you'd like to find out any more about the fascinating life of Violet Gibson, I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend this book, The Woman Who Shot Mussolini by Francis Stoner Saunders. It's an incredibly detailed biography and sheds light on a figure who would otherwise be lost to history, I suspect. Uh, I don't agree with everything she said, but it's a, it's a fascinating read nonetheless. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to hear more about any other mental health issues and how it's affected history and celebrities, then please subscribe to my channel and click the notifications bell to be kept up to date with all the latest releases. And I'll say goodbye for now and see you again soon.